you very much. Yeah, it follows very much, and I just kind of reinterpret an immersion here, rather like Daniela did, is to re immerse people, your students, our students, in learning. And it's sort of built up over the last two or three years in quite interesting ways, uh, supported by my own seniors. Because we were finding that if we look at the classic way of teaching programming languages, the sort of things that we went through, well, some of us, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it'd be 12, 12 weeks worth of lectures, and each lecture is how to do the when clause, the where clause, the, and then here are 10 exercises I created yesterday that are very good for you to teach you how to apply this. With absolutely no connection to any reality whatsoever. Just language, syntax, grammar. And as we all know, that's kind of boring for students, and they don't engage. And so what I've been experimenting with and developing over the last three years, in the various levels, first year, second year, well, first year, second year, and third year, and to masters a bit, but not very much, has been something quite different. I will not waste my time or my students' time talking about language, syntax, and grammar. That's in a book, that is in a set of um, chapters. So if you want to learn SAS, there's a 20 chapter uh, course for base SAS with about a gigabyte's worth of data and exercises and things that they can work through. So, here you are, guys. I was starting off, by the way, with a UCLA tutorial, self tutorial on SAS just to show that in 45 minutes you can start getting useful things out of this interesting language. And they get them going, we give them the 20 chapters for SAS, and hey, they start getting going. We do the same with other ones. But I want to start off now with another perspective of the problem. And Daniela actually kind of mentioned it as well. This comes from a report by uh, eSkills UK and SAS about three years ago about the hard skills relating to data analytics and the usual sort of things, language, uh, statistics, maths, and so on. But they have also pointed out that it's absolutely vital that students have the right-hand side. And as Daniela pointed out, very often we forget to develop the soft skills of our students. So the problem is we are quite good when we use the traditional didactic approach to teaching languages through these carefully prepared chapters or sessions, lectures on language syntax and grammar, or whether we push the students off to go learn it for themselves, which is what they'll have to do in the future anyway. But we forget that. And universally, we are criticised year by year by the employers to whom our students go, that our students are technically quite good, but they are unemployable because they haven't got <coughs> soft skills. So what we're doing is developing some rather interesting ways of forcing that development. Yeah, we make sure that they learn the, te the technical skills themselves, by giving them in the first year uh, module that you can read about a bit in the paper, we use uh, four short CBT, computer-based tests, that are based around the certification for base SAS. And that proves that they've got the basic technical skills. But then we give them a big challenge. Bear in mind, these are kids who've been in the university three and a half months. And we say, right, this is what SAS can do. Oh, and by the way, in pairs, you have also researched and learned about all sorts of cool things that SAS can do in terms of importing data, cleaning it up, how the graphical system works in SAS, how the graphics can work, and how the reporting system works. And they will actually each give in pairs a 10-minute lecture about how SAS does something cool. First time, formative review, peer-reviewed and formative from me, 
And then the second time, it should deliver 20% of their grade. That little presentation about something cool. So more confidence in presenting, more confidence in uh, standing up in front of their peers. And what we're trying to do is all the time getting them to do the learning, the research they need to learn, while we use our time to work on their soft skills. Give them confidence, help them develop, spending a lot of time mentoring. And for both of our the two modules that I'm really interested in, I've worked on a lot this year, we give them a big challenge, find a, the first year, find a couple of data sets which are related with something around 2,000 rows each and as many columns wide as you like and do something interesting and then you will provide a four minute video individually about your project. A self-reflective critique of what you did why did you choose that data? Why did you analyze it in the way that you did it? And what is the insight that you've gained? And that delivers for these first year students something like 40% of their grade. For the final year module, we were using the new IBM, newly released IBM Bluemix and Watson Analytics package. And we, brought, we, we spent some time, most of the time the lectures were about sort of broader uh, ideas about how the world of um, analytics is developing. We were looking at how to present, we used some of the YouTube uh, and Google um, presentations about how to present effectively, which of course was part of a continuous exercise we've been carrying out with the students over the last three years about how to develop their presentation styles. And then they have a 15 minute presentation at the end of their um, the project, each of them, a PowerPoint with voiceover, which we turned into videos now. And what was interesting was we gave them Bluemix and we gave them access to the, the full power What's an analytics, 500 columns by 10 million rows worth of data. So we're not talking trivial amounts of data now, folks. And we said, find a big set of data. We didn't prescribe quite how large it was, but we gave strong indications that we were looking at the, the larger end. And we said, you can choose any data you like from wherever you like, as long as it is of interest to you. And you've got to do some interesting uh, analysis that comes up with some interesting insights. Oh, and by the way, you must also adhere to the um, principles of data for humanity, which have come out of Heidelberg, I think it is, quite recently. Which is that thou shalt do no harm, essentially, with data analysis. It's kind of a reinterpretation of Asimov's three laws of robotics, but in terms of data analytics, it's really rather cool. So we gave them some criteria like that and then said, right folks, you can do whatever you like but you must come up with some really valuable insights and then you'll produce this uh, 15 minute PowerPoint presentation and you'll produce a voiceover for it and then that is what you will submit and that will give you 70% of the whole grade. And we got some spectacular uh, results. IBM are really, really interested because it's showing how you can use Bluemix and what's analytics in very, very interesting ways. We have one girl, and she's still not produced her revised video, which I really want to have up this shortly, where she, because of her background, has an interest in policing. I think it's family connection, probably. And she wanted to look at the relationship between levels of crime and the numbers of lampposts, or whether lampposts in Derby and City were. She got the, the data set from uh, Freedom of Information request in Derby City Council with every single um, lamppost in the city with its geolocation, black and longitude, and matched that to the crime statistics for the, for the county or for the city, and did something interesting. Another one looked at 
the idea you wanted to move into London and you want to find the best place to live. So he pulled together uh, things like wealth profiles and numbers of call-outs for ambulances on the grounds that ambulances for uh, accidents and so on might give you a feel for crime, might give you a feel for where, where it's dangerous to live somewhere. And he put those two together. And his data set actually, if I remember correctly, has something like 49 million rows rather than the maximum of 10 million rows that you could have done it with. Now what this all does is develop their ability, their confidence to put together a really good story, to understand how to tell stories, thinking about things like what do they want to say, which is everything, and that's our problem too often with our presentations here. I'd love to say everything, but I've got to work out what I need to say, based on who my audience is. And we drill this into them year, almost semester by semester. And then we're using this soft skills form of assessment. We don't go and look at the code. We don't have a hands-on demonstration. We get them to simulate the, this, the final year one what they will be doing next year when they have this analytics question from a customer in their company, the marketing director said, for example, who said, I want to find out something, but I don't know where you're getting data, but this is what I want to find. So that's what they did. And then they come back almost and simulate the post-implementation report, where they've done the work, the analysis, they've come up with the insights, and they're reporting to the board. So they've got to satisfy the marketing manager who's, or director who's a direct customer, they've also got to satisfy the head of IT, chief information officer, that they've done the job for properly, they've collected the data right, they've cleaned it up correctly, and so on and so forth, and they've done the right stats and such. And so that's what we try to simulate. So we, get, we give them a very prescriptive structure in the sense of you will cover this topic, they, why have you done the project, how did you get the data? How did you tidy it up? And then, what were the critical insights about the data, about the question that you asked? And step by step. But then they have total freedom. And it's quite remarkable if you do that, they will choose really, really interesting subjects. So, I mean, what you get from them is so much more interesting that if we provide them with, here is 10,000 row uh, spreadsheets I found somewhere, and I want you to do this, this, and this. I want you to do a no, multi-way ANOVA, I want you to do a multi-way t-test. And, where does that connect to anything? Get it connected to the real world, connected to the type of work they're going to be doing in the in next year when they graduate. And by golly, yeah, you see, engagement like you've never seen before. They're doing things because they really, really want to. They go and find out how to do things because they want to be able to do that. So they'll go onto the web and find the learning material. I don't teach them anything about the technicalities. I teach no answers. I only teach questions. Then they go and find the answer that's relevant to them in their position. And any um, scheduled time that I have is mentally <coughs> is working with them on a one-to-one -one basis. I treat this whole thing in terms of developing this soft skills approach that I am no longer academic as domain expert. My role here with my teacher, uh, students is academic as learning to learn expert. Because they need to know how to learn for life. If I to use the academic as domain expert, all I am tempted to do is try to channel and pour all of my exciting and cool knowledge into their heads. And we all know that hardly works at all. It goes in one ear, it gets anywhere, and comes out the other ear. There's very little kept in between. If you give them the challenges for them to learn, 
given serious challenges that connect to the real world, the world of work that they will be using next year. It changes the dynamics. And they will go and learn. They will go and find out how to do it. And that's what they will be doing. We see in our third year students who are out on placement. They're doing stuff that they, we haven't taught them, or they haven't learned at university. And they have to go out and find on the internet, or wherever, how to do whatever it is. Things are changing too fast. So we, they have to keep up to date with the latest stuff by going out there. And what it does is gives them that self-confidence, it gives them the soft skills that they need. This presentation is already up on the internet for you to go and download. Um, I'll tell you how to find it in a minute. These are four presentations by the four best of our students, three in, the, in Derby, um, in the UK, and this one was by a student at a partner college of ours out in Bangladesh. And that was a, is a spectacular tour de force uh, in terms of understanding what Watson Analytics and IBM Bluemix can do. Um, and it's a really spectacular piece where he was simulating the work that needed to be done to set up a new small business in Dakar. And the objective was this, what a product set was really most appropriate for a small company set up to sell mobile phones in Dakar. He pulled together five different sets of data from public sources, massaged it, came up some ideas, and then even went to the trouble of building a small shopping cart uh, exercise for the, the company to work with. So these are four of the hot links that you can go straight to if you want to. What happened? Well, All of the, the students passed in, in the UK. There's what, four, plus about 13 students there. Not as good a profile as we would have hoped. I think um, we now know enough to be able to mentor all of the students next year to move them up at least one grade back. What this normally does, this approach, is to have no failures at all. And unfortunately, in the first year module this year, we didn't actually choose that for all particular reason. The reason is those six students at the far um, right are having problems with being at university, shall we say, in every single one of their modules. So we're not quite sure what's happening at that end, but you'll see those who are behaving like normal students, like good students, are getting 55% and above. And I think that's a fairly reasonable um, distribution. I think next year we should, if we can get to grips what's going on for those five, those six over there, we should be able to do somewhat better. But we don't know yet. But it's quite interesting how the distribution is quite heavily skewed ultimately to the, um, to the high grades because it connects. Okay, folks, thank you very much. I think that's about right. I think I'm <laughs>
1030, I think it was, wasn't it, John? Uh, because this is a question that keeps coming up. How can you apply? And I'm running a workshop um, week on Monday, week yesterday, when I get home, um, at our university learning teaching conference. How can you apply this approach to most subjects in the STEM environment? Because we do have this feeling, I need to teach composition, etc., etc., etc. And the question is, ultimately, what are we trying to achieve? And what is the framework we're trying to give our students? Are we teaching frameworks as a set of interesting questions or evaluable questions? Or are we trying to teach answers? You see, if I teach you an answer, you stop learning. If I teach you a question, you will probably remember it. Now, if I think, look back over 40 odd years of my career, a bit more than that. In the field of computer science and IT, to all intents and purposes, none of the questions we're asking today have changed in 40 years. The answers have changed and change every day almost. They change in every company you work in, in every situation. So if I teach my students questions, then they are set for life. And interestingly, you can turn, when you think of a lot of the stuff we talk, teach, whether it's in data science, whether it's in statistics, whether it's in physics, we teach them as the laws of nature. And we, we look at the law of gravity, so-called, m1, m2 over g r squared or something, whatever the formula is, that is the answer, is the way we normally teach it. However, if you think about it a different way, that is actually a very interesting question. Because I take two objects, a leather, a lead ball in that hand and a feather in that hand. Why doesn't that one behave like M1 over M1, M2 over whatever? What's, go, what's missing? <coughs> Friction and and and. Why can I drop a hapser? out an aeroplane at 20,000 feet, and when it finally lands, it wanders off. Anything much bigger goes and splat. And it, a way of, and we te teach things like ISO 2000, uh, 27,000, uh, 27, sorry, which is the security framework, as kind of a law how you do information security. If you look at 27,002, it's an incredible set of questions that you can ask yourself as a company or as a chief, chief um, security officer, how am I doing as, my, as an organization? What is my risk? So I use my risk assessment as a set of questions that guide me through the 270 of questions or subparagraphs of the process. And so if you turn your algorithms and decomposition into questions, maybe you'll see something different there. Maybe you'll see how you can use soft skills approach as a way of enforcing the learning of that. Or you build, so, yeah. But just a supplementary question. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned about your students on the right hand side of the graph because I think what you're saying is you've got a different paradigm and that paradigm has failed in the way that's all other Those six will have failed every module. There's something, a problem with them, in that we believe that they do not particularly want actually to be at university. I, I appreciate that, but this paradigm that you're talking about has done no better to those failing students than any other paradigm. That is correct, but it does, for those who are engaging, it's doing a lot better, they're doing a lot better. So, so how are they assessed? How are they assessed? So, so, so you've got a, a new way of, of teaching. Yeah. Do you use traditional assessment or a new way of assessment? I, as I said, the assessment is a video presentation. In the past, we would probably have done a, a code walkthrough or we'd have had them to do a demonstration to us. Now what we're doing, we're saying here is you've got four minutes, um, plus or minus very, very little, and you can produce a video that will be a reflection on what you've done. And that was for 30 or 40% of their grade. How was that assessed? We watch it. We have very carefully provided, 
at the session on Thursday, I can show you the actual rubric that gives them the criteria. There are three or four different criteria um, that are actually there, very, very clearly expressed from 35, 37%, then the third, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, 90 percent bands on three criteria. And they can actually use, well, we, we coach them to use those criteria to actually uh, decide how they're going to present, to drive their achievement to the highest possible level that they're capable of. So they have the, the rubric criteria of um, what, what's required, typically three criteria. And we, they have all of those bands very clearly explained beforehand. From the day they're given the challenge, in probably week two, they are understand how to use the property rubric. And I do that from the first semester, first year, to explain and get students to understand how rubrics are there, not as a nasty thing to, to reduce their grades to the lowest possible level, but the, the rubrics are there to help them develop their answers to the best possible standard and I, that we can use to justify the best possible grade for them. I have a follow-up question. Yeah. So how do you make sure that the analysis is correct, in particular in the first and second semester? You, you have to check if they do the right thing. What we're doing there is looking at the, making sure that they, in their videos, they're explaining what they're doing and then <coughs> With, I mean, with something like the final year one, the, the, you've got what's an analytics, which is a very magical environment. And if you want to look, talk to me about what what's an analytics does, I'll be very happy to talk um, to you separately. With SAS, then it's fairly simple because they typically, in that first year, will do some fairly simple stuff. They won't go into much in the way of uh, complex statistics. Um, they will tend to do more graphical stuff. And we have just explained that. I mean, in a sense, the same sort of thing we do in sort of here, in this sort of environment, academically, where we've got small numbers of, say, 30, 40 in the sample. We tend not to bother about high, high, high level statistics because we all know that statistics are meaningless on groups of 30, on 35 data points. There's not much you can do with 35. And you know, so we're, we're looking at shapes more than anything. And we want to understand, really, not so much the actual detail of the analysis, but how are you getting on, guys, at developing your self-awareness, your self-confidence in the soft skills? So we, we have time for a short question and a very short answer, please. Okay, so you teach them a lot of self-confidence and soft skills, um, but at the end of the day, do they feel like they have um, technical skills as well? feel like they're good at their job or what they are going to but are they at least as confident as knowing all the basics like the man over there said as well? Do they think they have this technical framework down, pinned down by doing their own learning? They, um, they, 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 I think if we look at the overall measure, one of the most important things is where they get to and do they get good jobs and yes these kids are I think some pretty good jobs. Um, in terms of technical competence I think they're as good as any around uh, from what I see of the work they do. Sometimes they're careless but then so are we all and I had a bit of a disappointment with one recently where when I did look at the data and then sort of did double check there was an unfortunate error but Mostly, you know, they've learned to do the right sort of things they've, because we point them very much in the direction these are things you need to be able to cope with or to be able to understand, and then you will choose the most appropriate of those techniques. 